Welcome to Scanner School. This is session number 133, Ask Scanner School, volume number 22. All session and show notes can be found online on our website at scannerschool.com slash session 133. Before we start this week's podcast, I want to take a second to thank our Patreon supporters. Now, Patreon is a month-to-month sponsorship platform, and we have three different support tiers with different benefits for your support. At a dollar a month, this donation lets us know that you are out there and supporting the podcast. At $3 a month, you will receive the podcast before the general public. You will also have access to an advertisement-free podcast with no middle break. This podcast we deliver to you each week via a private feed that you can add to your podcast player. For those listening via the web, you will receive an email with a link to the podcast as soon as it releases. The $5 level is the best benefit for your support. Not only do you receive the benefits of the $3 tier, but you also get a set of squelchy stickers mailed to your home, access to a monthly Patreon-only Zoom meeting, as well as future discounts and benefits for upcoming Scanner School courses and offerings. At $5 a month, this equates to about a dollar a week or a dollar per podcast episode. If you'd like to help support the podcast, you can go to scannerschool.com slash Patreon or scannerschool.com slash support. Now, I'd like to thank all of our Patreon supporters who are Craig Harper, Dan, Glenn Blum, Glenn Bryden, Guy Lee, Irvin Thibodeau, James Felling, Jeff Block, Jenny Taylor, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Mark Beebe, Paul Teal, Raymond Hill, Richard Armstrong, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Scott Vorder, Signals Everywhere, Tim Mazza, Ted Glundi, and William R. Cand. Let's get this podcast started. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. Okay, welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. My amateur radio call sign is W2LE, and this podcast is here to always teach you everything you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. If this is your first week joining us for class, let me say welcome and thanks for joining us. This podcast releases every Tuesday to teach you something brand new or something different about the scanner radio hobby. So this week we are answering your questions. If you go to scannerschool.com slash ask, you can submit your questions in two different ways. You can leave me a voicemail, which will qualify you to be in the running to win a free consulting call with me, or you can just email me or use the inline form to ask me your question as well. Now, of course, the third and secret way of asking me a question is email. If you email me a question as well, I will also respond to you guys here. But the priority goes to the people who leave me a voicemail. So again, you go to scannerschool.com slash ask, where you can click on the speak pipe button. When you click on that button, it will allow you to use your microphone on your phone, your tablet, or even your computer to leave me a voicemail. If you're unable to do that, you can always call us 516 516- 308-2885, and that's our voicemail number, where, again, you can leave us a voicemail. Again, if you leave us a voicemail via SpeakPipe or our regular voicemail number, it will put you in the running for a free consulting call. Now, our free consulting calls run for about an hour. Even our paid consulting calls run for about an hour. We use Zoom, so I can sit down virtually next to you and show you what's going on in your computer and we can walk through whatever it is that you're having issues with or something you want to learn about the scanner radio hobby again you can book us for a consulting call at scannerschool.com slash consulting or even scannerschool.com slash tutoring because really they are tutoring sessions all right that's enough of me so let's get into our very first question hi there i'm pete devasto you probably remember me i'm the blind guy who was on podcast number 86, talking to you about the experiences I've had trying to set up these newer scanners without being able to see the menus. Anyway, I've had a BCD-325 for a year and a half now, love the radio, and I've got it programmed really nicely. So recently, I decided to replace my BC-370CRS tabletop scanner was something more current, and so I got the 996P2. And, of course, it's almost a duplicate to the 325, so using FreeScan, I was able to pretty much clone the other scanner, so everything is really great. Now I have a question, because both scanners have an option that I do not understand, and that is, it's called Intermediate 
frequency exchange. You press funk and four, and it turns it on or off. What I'd like to know is, first of all, what exactly is it? And second of all, when would I ever need to use it? Thank you very much, and looking forward to hearing your answer. Take care, and have a great day, Phil. Hey, Pete. Great question. So IFX is basically what the button looks like on a scanner. Somebody's following at home and wants to know what this is. And as Pete describes, it is the intermediate frequency exchange. So let's talk about how this actually works and where it's useful. Now, again, this will answer both of your questions, Pete. So the IF, or the intermediate intermediate frequency in your scanner is what happens is let me back up a little bit here so when you receive a signal you're not actually receiving what you think you are let's put it that way so if you're listening to for example 130 megahertz okay you're not actually tuned to 130 megahertz you're tuned to something that's either lower or higher than that plus or minus your intermediate frequency so why now, are we doing this? It's a head scratcher for a little bit, right? But it makes perfect sense if you can kind of wrap your head around how this all works. So an IF is a set known frequency. So in many scanners, it's 10.6 or 10.7, maybe even 10.8 megahertz. It, it could be even different as far as, as far as things go. But I remember back in the crystal days, you had to buy your, your, your crystals in either a 10.7 or a 10.6 or a 10.8, uh, I believe, what, what they were. And again, Realistic and, and Uniden and Radio Shack, they all had different IFs in the scanners. And if you would take a crystal that was set up for a different IF and you put it into your scanner, you would actually get a different receive frequency. So again, why is this happening? So what an IF is, again, it's the known oscillating frequency in your scanner. And, and it, it works out really well because when you think about it, your scanner covers large spectrums of RF, right? They go from like 30 megahertz, 26 megahertz, whatever it is, right? 20, 25, all the way up to 1.3 gig. And think about that just alone, 1.3 gig. That's a huge, huge footprint when it comes to figuring out how to configure, how to build, how to optimize, add filters, the whole deal to get a radio to work on a whole large path of frequencies like that. Well, you know what? It's a whole lot easier if you know what your IF is and you can design the entire frequency around your IF, your known frequency. So all the all, all the capacitors, all the diodes, everything that goes into the whole radio circuitry is all known on that one frequency and it's all optimized for your IF frequency. Well, what happens is when you turn your radio and you're changing the tuning, right? You're changing the variable frequency oscillator. And this VFO is basically you controlling the reception of the scanner. Now, again, you could step up or step down depending on you know where it is you're, you're listening to. And this can take us into a whole tangent and a whole nother, a whole nother set of frequencies and even modifying radios to go completely out of band. It, the terminology for it actually slips my mind at the moment. But again, the guy I bought my HF radio from was actually using that where he would he would actually use an HF radio, but use it to tune completely out of band and like say two meters and 440 because he was using all the tuning specifications in the HF radio to give him HF and CW. But in the end, it was he was taking the IF out and, 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 and the receive out and trans it was trans something or other. But uh, somebody out there is screaming out there. Screaming at their podcast, playing, going, this is what it is. This is the answer. So if you know the answer to that one, make sure you send me a reply or leave a comment in the podcast, scannerschool.com slash session 133. And I'll go, oh, yeah, that was it. But anyway, going back on track here. So you've got your VFO. You've got your IF. So what ends up happening is, and let's just talk round numbers here to make things simple so we can kind of understand what happens here. You want to receive 130 megahertz, okay? You have a 10 megahertz IF. So now you're receiving at 130 minus 10 or 120. Your VFO is actually tuned to 120 megahertz. So 120 megahertz added to the 10 megahertz of the IF gives you a receive frequency of what's on your display of 130 megahertz. So that's what the IF is in kind of in a really, really, really simple term, how it works and what it does. I have I have really simplified this as pretty much to a block diagram, magic box type of, type of explanation for you guys here. Maybe in a future, future podcast, we'll bring somebody in that knows a lot more, who can explain this a lot better than I can, because 
I can really get lost on on tangents on, on explaining this one. But anyway, so let's say now you want to listen to, say, 450 megahertz. Well, again, your IF is 10 megahertz. So now instead of listening to 450, your actually VFO is tuned to 440. You add the 10 of the IF, gives you the 450. But what happens, though, when you have a birdie on the frequency, right? Your, your scanner is getting stuck on a channel. You're getting a dead carrier. Something is coming in and causing an interference on that frequency. Is it an interference of the IF? Is something coming in at 10 megahertz that's screwing up the entire radio? Or is something coming in around 420 that is causing a problem with your radio? Well, this is what the IF exchanges for. It actually changes the intermediate frequency of the scanner. It changes out that IF, that frequency. So let's just say for an example here, and to make things simple and pretty, instead of being 10 megahertz, it's a 20 megahertz IF. And again, you want to listen to 450 megahertz. Well, instead of now tuning your scanner to 440 on the VFO, you're actually tuning it to 430. And maybe that birdie isn't coming in at 430 megahertz. Now, all of a sudden, you have taken 430 plus 20 on the IF, you're still receiving 450 megahertz, but you have now shifted the IF, which now means you've shifted the VFO, and a different frequency is now basically being received by the scanner. So by using the VFO, I'm sorry, but by using the IFX, you can potentially get rid of different types of interference coming into your scanner. It's a really interesting design. It's really cool that they can do it, and I think it's a great, a great little tool to have inside the scanner. So again, if you get any birdies on it, you'll you can push Funk 4 on that scanner, Function 4. And for those following also at home, you would actually see on the display the letters I, F, X to let you know you have enabled the intermediate frequency exchange on your scanner. Pete, it was great to hear from you again. I'm glad to hear that you're still enjoying the scanner radio hobby. I'm very happy to hear that you've upgraded from your clock radio scanner, your CRS, into a 996 radio as well. So being, Pete, that you are the only person to send me a message via our voicemail medium, you automatically win this month's free consulting or free tutoring call. So Pete, please reach out to me. And we'll schedule in something that works for the two of us. And we'll sit down for an hour and either we'll catch up or we'll walk through whatever else it is that you have any questions about using your scanners. I always love catching up with you, Pete, and talking with you and and, and understanding what it is and, and, and the struggles that you have with the scanner radio market. Because, again, like as, as we've talked and we've discussed, everything now is almost menu-driven. And it's nearly impossible for somebody who can't see to understand what is going on in their radios and their scanners. And to me... That, that you're able to do so is uh, I, I can't wrap my head around how how you are, how you're doing it. But it's it's awesome that you are. I'm glad to hear that you're in the hobby. If anybody else out there is in the same uh, same boat, we can even set up a group for you guys to uh, communicate with and everything else as well. So, again, Pete, congratulations on the free consulting call. And um, we'll talk soon. Thanks again for asking your question. All right. Let's go on to our next one. All right. So our next question comes in from Alan. N6HPO, and he writes, Hello, Phil. This past November, I bought an SDS 200 unit in scanner. My wife and I are members of the local CERT team in San Diego's North Country. We use the scanner as a heads up during wildfire season. After setting up my scanner, which is quite different from the older 996T, I've never caught on on how to quickly add keys to my favorites. He's got 10 favorites list currently. So he asks, Alan asks, does each favorite require a quick key, each system, each department? Many thanks for taking the time to respond. All right, Alan. So the short answer is no, but the short answer could also be yes. <laughs> okay, so let me explain this one. When I set up my Home Patrol style scanners, that's my 436, the 536, the SDS-100, and the SDS-200, I typically do not program in favorite list quick keys. These are the FLQKs, favorite list quick keys. Each favorite list is able to be assigned a quick key. All right. And you've got one through 99 on your quick keys. Maybe you'd have zero in there as well. Now, these favorite list quick keys are an easy way to toggle the favorites lists off and on. 
Now, when I set mine up, I normally just use the menus and go through and toggle the, the favorites list off and on that way. Now, as a side note here, and I went through a tutoring session just this past week where this came up. We were trying to add favorites list quick keys, and they weren't turning the banks off and on, the favorites list off and on. That's because in the menu system, when you program up your SDS 200, you have to also make sure that the favorites list is on in the scanner. Then you are able to toggle the favorites list quick key off and on. It doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it works. So, does each favorite list require a quick key? That's entirely up to you as to how you want to set things up. If you want to make life easier for yourself and you only have 10 in there, that's great. You can set up favorite list quick keys 1 through 10 on your on your scanner or 1 through 0 and then toggle each favorites list quick key off and on. Now, each system, you can have multiple systems within a favorites list quick key. Say, for example, you have a county conventional and a county trunking. Each one of those would be a system under a quick key. Each department would follow suit. So, for example, let's just say in my SDS 200, real life example here, I have Nassau County Fire because I live in Nassau County, New York. Now, I would have a conventional system for Nassau County Fire that has all of my conventional frequencies in there. I would also have under that quick key or that favorites list, I would have a trunk system, a P25 trunk system. I would also have an EDAX trunk system in there as well because sometimes on rare occasions, the fire districts happen to use their old EDAX talk groups. I don't know why. It's just the way things are around here. So... I could say, for example, favorites list quick key one is for Nassau County Fire. Under that favorites list quick key, I could say system quick key one is for my conventional frequencies. System quick key two would be the P25 system. And system quick key three could be my EDAC system. So now I've got favorites list quick key one, system key one, two, and three defined. Well, let's take even further now. In my conventional setup, I have got nine battalions plus a county-wide. So to make my life easier, I've mapped each battalion to a quick key. I have battalion one to, to quick key one, two to quick key two, three to quick key three, four, etc. And then the county-wide, I have determined I'm setting it up to department quick key zero. So again, I can have, now if I want to jump into or lock out rather, battalion one, Nassau County Fire Conventional, in my Nassau County Fire favorites list, I would do 1.1.1. Again, 1 being favorites list 1 for Nassau County Fire, 1 being conventional system, and then 1 being Battalion 1, which was Department 1. Now, if I want to lock out, for example, Battalions 2, 3, 4, 5, I would have to hit 1.1.2, enter. 1.1.3, enter. 1.1.4, enter. And then 1.1.5, enter. That would then lock out favorites list quick key one, system one, and then departments one through five. But what if I just wanted to turn off favorites list quick key one? Simple. You just hit one, enter. Or what if I wanted to do favorites list key, favorites quick key one and system two and not worry about each department? I just wanted to lock in, in and out based on the system. Again, 1.2, enter. Everything beyond that point in the tree is controlled by the parent. So the department would be controlled by the system. The system would be controlled by the favorites list quick key. Okay? So I know it's a little bit confusing, but that's how these systems work. It really helps you to, to kind of plan things out if you can see them in your head or work at a flow chart. Looking at Sentinel can really help you out here because, again, when you click on new favorites list, you have a new a new part of the tree. That's your favorites list quick key. You can sign it there. Then everything below that favorites list quick key is a system. Everything under each system is a department. Again, each department will hold your conventional frequency or your talk group IDs. Now, to make things a little bit more confusing for you as well, each site in a trunk system can also have a system quick key assigned to it as well. So that's also something you want to probably 
refresh yourself on is that. And if you are listening to a trunk system, I do have a podcast that can help you out with that one as well. You can go back and you can listen to session number 131, where I talked about optimization tips for Uniden DMA scanners. Also on 129, I talked about Uniden systems and groups. And also on 130, we talked about trunking sites. That was part of my last mini series that I ran through the month of June. So hopefully that will help you out as well. Alan, if that didn't answer your question, please let me know, and we can even dive into this even further. So again, just so you got to get it, favorites list quick keys are what would be considered banks in like your old 996 T. That's probably the best way to think about it in there as well. All right, Alan, 73, and thanks again for your question. We'll be right back with some more questions. Did you know there are ways to help support the Scanner School podcast that doesn't take any time or any extra money on your part? If you go to scannerschool.com slash support, you will find we have several ways that you can continue to do your online shopping and help support us. We have links to Amazon. If you click on our link before you go to Amazon, anything you buy from there will help support Scanner School. Now, if you're in a market for a brand new scanner, an antenna, other accessories, we have links to Scanner Master, where you can not only purchase a scanner and accessories, but you can also get your radio programmed. And by clicking on our link before you buy, you are helping to support the podcast. Now, if you're in a market for software, we have links to Butel. And if you want something new to you, we also have links to eBay. Again, just go to scannerschool.com support before you make your purchases, and you are helping to support Scanner School at no additional cost to you. This session of Scanner School is sponsored by East Coast Pagers. Now, East Coast Pagers is one of my online companies, and we are a Unication, Apollo, and Swiss phone dealer serving the North American market. Now, if you're looking for a personal use pager or one fee department, we can get you a quote at the very best prices. So why does a company like East Coast Pagers support Scanner School? I think that every scanner reader user should at least put one pager in their collection of radios. The reason why is very simple. It frees up your scanner to just do scanning, and then you have one radio that's dedicated to your local fire activity. Now, with a pager, you can have voice storage. You can do tone outs. You can keep it silent. You can go back the next day and listen to what you've missed overnight. It's more than you can do with an out-of-the-box scanner. And with today's pagers, having multiple frequencies and even having multiple channels in a scan list, like the Unication G1 can do eight channels in a scan list. It has 64 memory channels, and out of the box, it comes with 11 minutes of stored voice and a desktop charger. The G2s to G5s, they do P25 phase one and phase two in simulcast environments with stored voice, paging on conventional NP25. Oh, and they're upgradable too to DMR type one and type two. They are more rugged than today's consumer based scanners. And with a pager like a Swiss phone S quad, you won't even realize you're wearing one. It'll help keep you informed as to what's going on in your neighborhood. So again, eastcoastpagers.com or contact me directly, phil at eastcoastpagers.com. Do you have a new scanner? You're having problems understanding how it works? Maybe you're new to the entire Home Patrol database of programming and you can't figure out Sentinel. Did you get a new SDR and you're trying to figure out how to install it or you want to learn how to use Unitrunker, DSD+, Plus, maybe set up a Pioware or even just make some changes and you don't understand how this system and the equipment works, the podcast might be great for you, but maybe you need a little bit more of one-on-one help with setting something up. I'm available to do just that with you with our private tutoring sessions. You can book me online by going to scannerschool.com slash consulting for a one-hour session. And it's great because we can actually share computer screens remotely and I can guide you through step-by-step as if I was sitting right next to you. So again, book me for an hour at scannerschool.com slash consulting for your scanner radio one-on-one tutoring session. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues too. So visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issues and sign up today. That's natcommag.com for National Communications Magazine. Okay, our next question comes in from Sam. Sam says, Phil, I want to order the SDS-200. I only want Oceana County, Michigan. 
How do I know if I need the upgrades? DMR, NXDN, or Pro Voice? Each one is $75. I live in Pentwater Village in Michigan. Thank you for the info, Sam. All right, Sam. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to jump in. I'm doing this live as I'm talking to you right now. We're going to go to Radio Reference, and we're going to go into the database. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate over to Michigan. And let's take a look, first of all, and see if we have any nation or statewide systems when it comes to anything we want to listen to here. So, again, we've got Red Cross, DOC, Natural Resources, State Police might be interesting, DOT, MedCom, and also statewide commons, all right? We've also got area-wide trunking systems, which is the Michigan Public Safety Communications Systems, or the MPSCS. It is a Project 25 Phase 1 system. So we know right off the bat, you're off to a good start because you bought an SDS 200, which will work beautifully in simulcast systems. And of course, you need to listen to this MPSCS system. So quickly, let's go ahead and look for your county on this system. So I'm going to go and look for Oceana. And we've got a system ID here of 64. So there's definitely some Oceana talk groups on here. And we've got Emergency Management, 911 EMS. We've got Life EMS, Roads Commission Dispatch, DPWs. We've also got some common interoperabilities. We've got some fire rescue groups on here as well. Law enforcement talk groups on this system. And most of these things I'm looking right now, they are just digital. There is non encryption in that county, which is beautiful for you. Also, Pentwater Fire Department paging is also on the trunk radio system. So you're already off to a beautiful start without having to spend any extra money on your SDS 200. But let's go back to Michigan. Let's jump in directly to the Oceana County page itself and see what else might be on that county. So I'm jumping right now into Oceana and I'm scrolling down and I'm looking for anything that is not NFM. So we've got basically county services. We've got uh, fire dispatches again. You got a hospital network out here. Pentwater fire dispatch is also on a VHF channel. You've got Walkerville and Hart Public Schools are all analog FM or FM narrow frequencies. You're off to a great start here. Now, you have got Deltacom which is an NXDN Next Edge system. And you've got Consumers Energy. So let's look at the Deltacom first. If this is something you're interested in, in monitoring, then yes, you would need to pay for the NXDN upgrade. Now, what is on this Deltacom system? You basically have a towing company, you've got a single hospital, and you've got three school bus talk groups. So if you don't have school buses to worry about or one or, or uh, Beaumont base and Nooners towing, you can pretty much skip the NXDN upgrade. Now, jumping into Consumers Energy, this is an EDAC system with Pro Voice. So scrolling through this Consumers Energy system, I'm seeing a bunch of A's, a bunch of analogs, and there's a couple of digital talk groups. We have an operations, a radio service, and a radio tech. Those talk groups marked in D would indicate that you need the Pro Voice update to your scanner. For the majority, though, of this system, it's all analog. Again, statewide talk groups, special incidents in, in different zones, distribution talk groups, central zones, north zones, pretty much is even the gas service is all analog in here. So unless you have to listen to the three or four radio services dispatch, that's all you're really going to get in the digital talk groups. So my advice to you is unless you really have to listen to those three talk groups and the three NXDN talk groups, the four NXDN talk groups we talked about, I would save you money and I would say don't worry about Pro Voice or NXDN. Now, DMR is a shocker for me. I'm, I'm surprised there's not more DMR in your area, to be honest with you. There's a lot of DMR other places across the country. And if you're interested, though, in listening to amateur radio, amateur radio has been pretty big as well into DMR. So maybe... The DMR platform might be of use to you if you wanted to listen to, say, for instance, some DMR repeaters. But even still, I'm going through the radio reference database here, and you know everything's kind of labeled up a little bit differently than they are by here. So I'm doing a search in radio reference, and I got 29 matches basically for amateur radio DMR use across the state of Michigan. So even going into Oceana, what do we have here as far as amateur radio frequencies? You guys are kind of thin. You've got 
three basically frequencies that have been submitted to the radio reference database for D, uh, for analog, and that's it. So DMR, I think, will be up to you. You may find more DMR that hasn't been submitted to radio reference, honestly, if you put the radio into search mode. But for now, the short answer, without having any further information in front of me at this moment, I would skip the NXDN and the Pro Voice, unless you really have to listen to those uh, extra talk groups, and enjoy the SDS-200 the way it came out of the box. Best of luck with the radio. It's a great little beast. And I'll actually have some training material coming, hopefully by the end of the year, on the SDS-100 and 200. So take a uh, keep an eyeball out for that as well. Sam, thanks again, and hopefully that answers your question. So our last question of the month comes from Glenn Dobos, KE4ZQP. Now Glenn says, I hold a general class license working on my extra. At the current time, I am a member of the Pinellas County Aries, also belong to the St. Pete Radio Club. For the past 26 years, I have been a member of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. I am certified in auxiliary telecommunications and work as a watch standard here in St. Pete. As you can see, I spend most of my time in emergency management operations. I would like to get a portable scanner and not spend a lot of money. I am not the smartest person in the world, so I would like to have it programmed to my area and some education on it. Glenn. All right, Glenn, listen. No worries about being not the smartest person in the world. The hobby is available for everybody, so don't let that ruin you, and don't let yourself down about that as well. All right? Nobody, nobody is is genius level here okay <laughs> not to offend anybody else but between me and you nobody in this conversation right now is genius level i also hold a general class license been working my extra for quite some time and i'm actually finally getting serious too about learning code all right it's, it's been something that i could never have gotten thankfully they got rid of the code tech or the code class which allowed me to really get into the technician's class license and get on hf but again i got a lot of people now turning off their podcast because Die hard code fans don't like uh <laughs> anyway, I am working on the code. And if you aren't shooting code too, I can I can actually pass some information for you as well on that. So anyway, going back to your question, uh how you'd like to get a portable scanner, not spend a lot of money on it. I I completely get that. And the first thing we really want to do is we want to look again, just as we did on Sam's question. We're gonna go live right now onto radio reference as I'm answering your question. So the first thing we're gonna do, obviously, we're gonna go into radio reference, we're gonna click on database, and we're gonna go down to Florida and look for Pinellas County. Now we do notice right away that Pinellas County has a P25 trunk system. So we know at least at this point right now we need something that's going to be doing or something that's going to be capable of handling P25. We also have, though, we have a statewide law enforcement system, which is an EDAC system, and it also has advanced extended addressing, which is the ESK. You have this uh Florida Light and Power System. You also have this Florida Interoperability System, this P6 system, and also FDARN network, which is a DMR network. So we have a couple things here to look at. So first, first and foremost, let's look at the cheapest solution here is looking at the statewide law enforcement talk group, which is EDAX. And pretty much every scanner will support EDAX. It's just a matter of whether or not it supports FSK. So going through this, we have a ton and ton and ton of of encryption and basically the encryption sits right now on FDLE, I guess, which would be the law enforcement talk groups, federal, highway patrol, Levy County has some, but let's look at Pinellas and doesn't it isn't even on here. So we can kind of look at this and say, okay, dodge a bullet on that one. The PSIC, again, we've got a lot of encryption on this one. Again, Lake County, Lake County, Lake County. Again, let's go to Pinellas, see what we got down here. Looking like you might have dodged a bullet on this one. There's no Pinellas on this one here, so you're good on this one. This uh, FARN network, or F-D-A-R-N, not really sure what this is for. <laughs> so we're going to split off on this one and not worry about it. But we do definitely have to worry, though, about this Pinellas County P25 Phase 1 network. So let's dig into this one, and we have... A couple of sites. You got site 2, 4, 5, 10, and 12. None of these are labeled simulcast. So, again, can't really tell you if you're required to get into the simulcast style of radius. We're only going by the information that we know from, here we go. I'm just here right here. Miscellaneous system information. This site is simulcast. It's all it says. This site is simulcast. So, maybe we do have simulcast to worry about here. 
think the database here needs a little bit of uh, of improvement, though, to be honest with you. It should say name, site 2, simulcast, name, site 5, simulcast. But anyway, going back here. We've got plenty, again, public safety. That's digital mode. Pinellas County Sheriff, digital, a little bit of encrypted on here. County Fire is digital with a very small encryption. And then you got schools, parks, services groups, and then Kenneth County, Pinellas Talk Group, St. Peter's Police Department. So, and St. Peter's does have some encryption on there as well. So here's the deal. We know right off the bat, we immediately we know we need a P25 scanner, all right? I mean, just, just for the fun of it, we'll look at Pinellas County and see what else we have as far as conventional goes. We have some P25. We've got some FM in here as well. You've got an encrypted Bel Air. Uh, looks like Bel Air is DMR encrypted. Still scrolling down, FM, FM, FM. So we know we need at least, again, like I said, P25. So the big question now is where do we introduce, get you into a scanner? Like I said, we know we need P25. My bare minimum on this one would be something like Udidin 325 P2. As far as portable goes, you could look at the Whistler TRX-1, the BCD 436 HP. But what really has me concerned here, though, is the simulcast issues. And simulcast being a real pain in the neck on the 325 P2, the TRX-1, or even the 436 HP. You look at the SDS-100. Now, the SDS-100, though, that's an expensive scanner. You're looking at spending like 600 bucks, whereas the 325 can get you in the door about 350 all right? Unfortunately, as a new scanner goes, that's that's the bottom of the entry point as far as price point goes is, is about three and a quarter to the 350 Now, if you're looking to have programming done, Scanner Master does do programming, so you can actually buy your scanner through Scanner Master. Ask them to program Pinellas County for you. I believe it's like 60 bucks, and then you would get hopefully a turnkey scanner that when you turned it on would work for you. Now, you can also get the same thing done if you buy the home patrols or anything else like that. So if you are interested in the 325 scanner and you want to purchase from Scanner Master, you can always go to scannerschool.com slash scanner master. That's our affiliate link over to Scanner Master. And if you use that link before you make a purchase, we would actually get credit for the sale is how that works. We'll make a small affiliate link is what it's, what it's called or a small piece of commission for referring business over to Scanner Master. So again, if it wasn't for the simulcast, I'd say no problems with the 325P2, no issues with the TRX-1, no issues with the 436HP. But again, I've taken out these radios into a simulcast environment, compared them to the SDS-100, and while the TRX-1 would be deaf, and the 325 is deaf, and the 436HP picks up a couple of talk groups, the SDS-100 is constantly going and constantly running, and is proving time and time again to me that it works really well in the simulcast environment. So you may want to go back, though, too, and, and listen to previous podcasts where we talked about how to eliminate or how to reduce Issues with simulcast. We have talked about that before. That's on session 18 of the podcast, scannerschool.com slash session 18. We talk about simulcast, what it is, and how to overcome it. So, again, if you can eliminate all the extra transmitter sites and only pick up one transmitter site, you may have a better chance of getting the digital talk groups because you're not fighting to put the image back together again. So, again, simulcast, if you want to think about it, if you're old enough to remember analog TV, and if you remember watching the news at night and you'd see ghosting, right? You'd see like the, the news anchor would be there and you'd see it twice. You're watching a sporting event. You see all the guys in the field there twice. Think about, you know, the analog TV channel would pick up the would pick up the main channel, but then it would have that propagation delay and it'd be just slightly out of sync. It's kind of like, again, with simulcast is different, but it makes it a great visual way of understanding how this all works. And your scanner doesn't understand how to take these two signals and put them back together again. So instead of saying that this is the best one here, ignore the, the delay or, or put things back in order and, and combine the two frequencies together again, it just gets confused and it doesn't know how to decode the signal. Whereas the SDS 100 and the 200 know how to put things back together again. Now, your other option, though, is playing with SDRs. You do something with uh, Unitrunker or DSD+. Plus. SDRs are about 30 bucks a piece. It does take some homework to get them set up and involved, but that's a much cheaper way of doing it. But again, you're losing the portability. You would need to have it tied to a laptop or something at home and then stream it with something like Zello or something like that. So it is a little bit more involved. Unfortunately, looking at the information I have in front of me, I'm not 
really set that a 325 would or wouldn't work for you based on what I'm seeing as far as information and radio reference. So hopefully that kind of gets you going in the right direction. And I apologize. I can't really give you a dead set answer, but it's not my money I'm playing with here. Let's put it that way. All right. So let me know how I did on today's podcast. Again, we talked and answered several questions that came in via our ask session. Again, scannerschool.com slash ask. Again, I want to congratulate Pete. Pete was the only person who asked a question via our voicemail method. So he has a free tutoring session. And again, if you have any future questions, scannerschool.com slash ask. You want to leave me feedback on today's podcast, scannerschool.com slash session 131. I'm sorry, 132. You can also leave me feedback by going online and leaving a comment in our session notes at scannerschool.com slash session 133. Also join us tonight online on Facebook and also on YouTube. And for our Patreon members, we're going to try doing this also to Zoom so you guys don't get a delay. It's the first Tuesday of the month tonight. If you listen to this live, again, scannerschool.com slash live to catch us live tonight. 73 everyone, we will talk to you all next week. Bye-bye.